Terry Fortier, VP of Video Strategy for Harmonic and President of the Ultra HD Forum, where he facilitates the next generation of viewing technologies. We set the clock, please. No? Okay. Oh, we stop. I take two minutes. So, um, hello, everybody. And uh, I'm glad to see uh, still some interest at this time. So, I'm sorry, I'm also French, so, but I've been here for a long time, so I speak a bit of English. Um, let's start by the subject. So, how can we improve the quality of experience on virtual reality? and what can we do on the technology side in order to improve this experience? So this presentation will be basically looking at the challenges of virtual reality video, what is happening today in VR, what are the techniques deployed commercially, and then introduction of tiled VR and how it works. And then we'll communicate on some quality and bitrate trade-off because at the end of the day, if we do all those technology of course, we want to improve the quality of experience, but we also want to know how much we are going to tax the network. Then, some idea of the complexity of the beast. And the most of the challenge you'll see is on the head end production, on the device we love to stick to those $100 device and these phones that you can buy from your uh, store. And then I'll share with you what we think is going to happen in the coming years. So first, this slide, you probably have either seen it or experienced it. Uh, VR 360 video is basically some cost involved in the production. The quality of capture is not always there. The bandwidth from what you see on the device is very high. Motion to, motion to photon latency is something we need to keep at minimum. Motion sickness, you saw that in the presentation earlier. And then the quality of display, we have to live with, with what the consumer electronics uh, industry gives us. So today, if you look at what is available, I would say, in the store or on the shelf, you have a capture of multiple HD camera, and this gives you basically uh, 4K by 2K after stitching. This is transmitted as is, the full viewport. And of course, it's very nice because you are absolutely not sensitive to the network delay, but the bit rate is quite high. We are going to transmit a 4K by 2K video. And then when you look at the display per eye, because you are not watching the complete video, you have limited viewport. We probably talking about 1K by 1K per eye, which is below HD. And then when we blow up on 4K display, then you have this uh, screen door effect problem and the video quality issues because you are upscaling HD to ultra HD. So this is what we do today. And no, it's not very popular and very uh, good in terms of quality. So video quality, as I mentioned to you, is not very good. So today, if you look at what is available, I would say, in the store or on the shelf, you have a capture of multiple HD camera. And this gives you basically uh, 4K by 2K after stitching. This is transmitted as is, the full viewport. And of course, it's very nice because you are absolutely not sensitive to the network delay. but the bit rate is quite high, we are going to transmit a 4K by 2K video. And then when you look at the display per eye, because you are not watching the complete video, you have limited viewport, we probably talking about 1K by 1K per eye, which is below HD. And then when we blow up on 4K display, then you have this uh, screen door effect problem and the video quality issues because you are upscaling HD to ultra HD. So, this is what we do today, and no, it's not very popular and very uh, good in terms of quality. So video quality, as I mentioned to you, 
is not very good. Uh, basically, on this chart, you will see uh, the internet usage and what we are doing today. Bitrate we are encoding for this type of legacy system is about 20 megabit per second, and you see it's about 20% of the average household, which means you are not going to reach a lot of people for a lot of people for not the great quality. Therefore, we can say that legacy system is not really uh, satisfactory. So, how can we fix that? And this is part of this uh, time VR streaming. First, you take a 360 panorama view that can be 4K or 8K. Then, you have a viewport, which is basically what your device can watch uh, with the field of view of your device. And this is what we call the viewport independent. Now, if you want only, if you want to optimize your system, ideally, you want only to transmit the white rectangle, which is the viewport, and ignore the rest of the video. So how do we do that? So we are cutting the video in tiles, and we are going to encode the full viewport on the head and side. And we are going to store this on the streaming server. And then when the user is starting to move the head, we are going to shift the tiles in the caching server. So that's what we call the viewport dependent view. So basically, we know what you watch, and we take the adjacent tiles of what you watch. We stream only those tiles, very important. We don't stream the full viewport, because otherwise we would uh, stream 8K. And this is where the bandwidth saving comes. Very important to understand. We only stream the tiles which is in your viewport. But because we are not magicians, we also need to carry a low resolution background. And this is basically like one quarter of the resolution of the complete viewport. And this is how you are going to bring the graceful degradation. The motion to photon delay will be close to zero because you always have something to watch. So what does it look like in an end-to-end -end workflow? Basically, you capture multiple cameras, you stitch, you encode. Outside of the encoder, you have a tiling system. We are going to basically be cached in a streaming server. This is HTTP-based transmission, so works on any, H any CDN. And then the client, who has an HAVC decoder, and this is something that is real. I brought you here a demonstration, if you're interested, at the end. And this is going to work on any HMD. Why? Because if I shoot 8K after the stitching, I'm going to transmit 4K, which is the capability of decoding, decoding capability of this consumer device. So this is fitting quite well in existing workflow because we know this works with legacy, so we know it's something we can upgrade, having a better, a, a new encoder, a new tiler, and of course a new client, you can upgrade your legacy system to your tiling system. So let's talk about the numbers. Motion to photon delay can be instantaneous because we have the backup layer. So what we measure on commercial CDN is about 20 to 40 milliseconds when the caching server is not too far from the consuming device. Very important, we only require one single decoder, which is either hardware or software based, but there is no trick of scalable video codec. This is very uh, client friendly. And in terms of bandwidth reduction, what we have measured, you'll see some numbers, is about five times less than the classical approach. If you want to transmit 8K, for those who are playing with 8K in this room, is about 100 megabits per second. So if you find a network that can do that and a device that can do that, let me know. So 
If I look at the 4K tile VR, so I produce 4K and I transmit an HD, then I will have about 5 to 9 megabits per second. That's what we have measured. For 8K production, after tiling, after stitching, sorry, we are measuring about 14 megabits per second in the experiments we have done. If I measure that compared to a 4K dash legacy system with a, a ladder of adaptive streaming, I will have about 4 to 20 megabits per second. So what are the benefits of this technology? So first, we bring quality because we are going to give you the maximum number of pixels which is matching your display. This is something that offers graceful regulation thanks to the backup layer. It's a low delay system. You always have something to watch. And we optimize today the system in order to have it uh, pre-cached in the, in the CDN. And you'll see some numbers. It uses standard encoders and decoders, assuming you have an HEVC tile encoder. It's a use of a single decoder on the player side. You can have up to 8K panorama on existing device that cannot, of course, decode 8K because we are going to send only the viewport. We do not observe any motion sickness. Low motion to high resolution latency, uh, since we have uh, measured between 20 and 40 milliseconds. It's using HTTP infrastructure. So for time being, we don't have yet uh, this in MPEG dash, so it's a property file format since the standard is still in development. And it's a pre standard solution, as you know, uh, this week as we speak. MPEG is meeting on MPEG uh, OMAF, trying to standardize all those techniques for uh, interoperability and uh, all the tools that can be used with MPEG dash, such as encryption. So, what are the quality trade offs? So I come back with my uh, boring cor curve. What are the bit rate and what are the, the coverage? So if I take my legacy 4K dash, it's basically low quality, high bandwidth, and this is the rate curve. I'm reaching 20% of the population. If I use the tiling technology with a 4K production system, I will be in a similar quality of experience. But the bit rate, as you remember, is divided by two, so we are about seven uh, megabits per second. Now, if I use the Tile VR 8K, I'm going to bring you a higher quality of experience with a lower bit rate compared to what you have with Legacy. So basically, the Tile VR technology can address two targets, reduce the bit rate, or increase the quality of experience. Both cannot work at the same time, as it's a different uh, point in the optimization of the system. So for those who are interested, and I really push you to read the paper, because this is quite technical. So we have done all the different measurements from origin to CDN, CDN to client, decoder to renderer to HMD. And those are all the different steps and all the different delays we have measured. So this is something that runs today on commercial CDN. And we were showing at IBC, actually, on the, on the Gear VR, streaming from a server base in Amsterdam. And we were able to stream it uh, in the show on a 4G network, actually, from KPN. So this is all the different elements. And I really advise you to look at the paper, because this is where we describe all the different steps, what are the different delays incurred in the system. So this is a summary of the measurement we have done. So you'll see here three use cases. One is what we call the call cache, where the cache is not populated at the edge of the CDN. Then you have another one, which is cache with a call cache with a warm hit, with cache hints, which was already uh, pre-populated some of the content at the edge. And then the warm cache, where the cache is in optimal configuration, always able to serve from the edge and don't have to go on the origin server. And you see that if we have a warm cache uh, architecture, we can have very quickly in one or two, I think it's two frames, two to three frames, we're at 100% of the high resolution content available. If you don't have, uh, if you have a cold cache, you see that 
sometime even after 11 frame, you don't have the content available. So the caching strategy is quite important in order to offer the high resolution experience. Of course, we do not want to offer the low resolution experience. This is the whole purpose of this technology. So it's a nearly seamless experience on a warm cache scenario. And this is the good news. We know we can have a, a way to offer nearly seamless experience. So let's look at the complexity because everybody say, oh, this is looking very nice. Can you share with us the complexity? So what I've done, uh, I've taken a legacy system, which is captured 4K by 2K, transmitted 4K by 2K, displayed on a Gear VR 2.5K by 1.5K. And this is using ABR encoding techniques. So I've taken as a reference the encoding SD, the SD unit, what is the unit is basically a SD live encoder. So for this, we, are, we require for legacy 4K, 64 equivalent of a live SD encoder. So this is a lot already of capacity. If I take the tile 4K, I'm capturing 4K by 2K, I'm transmitting 2K by 1K, same display, but here no adaptive streaming. The complexity is 48 SD equivalent encoders. And if, so you can see here that it's a similar uh, complexity as ABR, but at a much lower bandwidth. So that's the first interesting point. If I now take the Tile 8K, I'm producing something which gives me a stitch picture of 4K, 8K3 by uh, 2K. I'm going to transmit 4K by 2K and my display is 2.5K by 1.5K. No ABR encoding. I am at 192 SD equivalent encoders. So this is taxing the complexity, but this is where you get your gain in terms of quality. So four times more pixel for three times more processing, not too bad in terms of ratio. So we also look at the decoding complexity and right now it's still early stage. So I do not want to draw uh, too uh, early conclusion, but if I look at legacy dash, I can do 4K P60 on the Gear VR. It's very smooth playback. If I do tile 4K in P30 is the maximum frame rate we can achieve today with the, the Gear VR uh, Samsung library. And the tile 8K, we can also, uh, we're also limited if we want smooth playback to P30. So basically it requires twice more CPU than the legacy system. So still some limitation, and we hope next generation of device will be able to give us more CPU power uh, if we stay at the same display. So what are the next steps? First, we want to reach Tile 8K VR P60 end-to-end -end performance production and display. Second, we want to develop a live and file cloud-based workflow. You saw the level of complexity, we are talking about pretty large number of CPU and CPU cycles. Of course, we want to continue optimizing an end-to-end -end latency because we believe uh, this has to be like nearly seamless for the consumer. Interesting enough, we were showing at IBC this technology on the tablet and the next step for us will be to put that on the set-top box and I just came back from China where we had all the Chinese operators uh, screaming at the set-top and cheap guys say, how come we don't have VR on our set-top box? So we think this is something very important. I'm glad to have Technicolo in the room put some pressure on the set-top box guys and also some of the cheap guys also in the room, but we also need to have, I would say we need to bet on multiple horse. HMD is nice, but tablet is also nice. And TV is also nice. And we don't know at this stage what will be the best type of consuming device depending on the different type of production and use case. And I, I like very much what Pierre was presenting. It was quite eye-opening to see that there are multiple technology, multiple ways to produce, multiple ways to present a story. And we cannot say, okay, everything is on this device. This is wrong. We'll have to accommodate with different type of device. And that's why we think it's very important support across all those type of devices. Last but not the least, 
we need some standards. And as you know, uh, MPEG is pushing quite hard on this. It's called MPEG OMAF. And there's also a group which has been formed. I was one of the founders called the VR Industry Forum, and we have a few members in this room. And I will do, if the, the chair let me do my slate of advertisement. So this VR Industry Forum is basically a group of about 30 companies. And you see uh, people like uh, Sony, Sky, Technicolor, who are heavy investors in this technology, are members of this group. And we also have uh, the broadcaster like EBU, and we have NAB, and we, we want to bring more and more content provider. So I really, if you like the story, if you think this is something that needs to bring the entire community, we want to invite you. Uh, go to the website of vrindustryforum.org, uh, and you will see uh, our uh, guidelines which have been uh, published about uh, this viewport technology. So what I presented here is part of this uh, specification. So that's it for me for time being. So I'm uh, available. We have 10 minutes for questions. I'm sure there will be many. And at the end, for those interested, I also have a cool demo of uh, 8K uh, tiling technology on this device. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Good presentation. Have you considered the possibility of using a return path uh, response back to the client to determine if there's more capacity in that network to either resize your window of perception or to provide a halo around it with a slightly less degraded background? So you want to, from the user reaction, send less information? Uh, no, I want to be able to say, hey, I've got more bandwidth capacity. Yeah. than what you're currently using. Could I improve the size of the space that you're giving the best resolution to or provide oh. a halo around that window? So today what we do, yeah, that's true. We only give a fixed window, but technically if I have more capacity, I could give you more. For example, you could have a basic service, which is what we do today. <clears throat> and I know, for example, the 5G guy are telling me why you give me this small window, give me your 100 freaking megabits, and my client today can take an 8K input and just take the window. So we, we do that today, but this is a lot of bandwidth. I know your company is probably interested to sell gigabits. So yes, yes, we can. Like <laughs> Obama, President Obama said, yes, we can. We can do that. Uh, also, uh, in user experiments, how, uh, how jarring how long did it take people to recover from turning into the less highly resolved? So, How long did the, the user feel like it took So forever? what we see today, when we cache the content on the device, we still have a lag of 20 to 40 milliseconds. And what we see in the CDN use case, without having very optimized network architecture, it's about this 40 milliseconds. You saw the warm cache, mm -hmm. the cold cache. No, the challenge for you is, if we bring this cache at the edge of your network, at the same position in a network as a VOD server, I'm sure we'll have, you will have the best quality of experience on the planet. Okay. The ping time will be zero. Right. In a gigabit connection from your VOD server to the device, you will win. Okay. Thank you. It's working for charter, by the way which has a, a program for gigabit uh, to the home. Hey, Lars Borg, Adobe. Uh, your tiling is great when I'm turning my head sideways, but when I'm looking up, because of the uh, VR frame sampling structure with, uh, what's to say, a lot of samples in the vertical directions, how do you resolve that? Do you need a different tiling pattern to, to so, optimize for that case. So you think you, the, the um, prefetch is different from horizontal or No, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the image, the, the VR image yeah. structure itself. Yeah, yeah. The VR image frame yes. uh, has uh, different spatial, yes. different spatial, different okay. vertically. And yeah. how do you solve that? Because then you kind of need more so, tiles. Okay. So you are touching an interesting topic. I, I was not allowed to present because I don't have enough time. 
So this is the geometry mapping discussion. So a crew rectangular versus uh, uh, pyramid versus uh, cubic. So we are, we have moving, we have moved actually from a crew rectangular to uh, cubic. And in cubic we see better efficiency and less artifacts. But you talk to the Facebook people, they said this is not good, we need a pyramid mapping. And then uh, I'm always asking them who is going to do that in real time. And they tell me we have enough farms of servers, we can do everything you want. I'm still concerned for the operators to have some kind of cost effective trade off, let's say a good trade off on the complexity and the scalability. So right now we are at uh, the cube. And I think this is what MPEG is also recommending. I am. I'm Vlad from Skype, not from the actual Skype, the company. So, um, Three questions. Uh, you mentioned that there is a requirement to have one decoder. How does that work with the, the requirements also to have that blurry background tile delivered in parallel with the current viewport and all the tiles there? The second question is about what, what's the minimum set of um, characteristics a client device needs to have to support tile-based streaming? And the third question was around uh, um, ABR. So in, I think you had a table where you said that for traditional there is ABR, for tile-based 4K, ABR switched off, and then for the 8K version was switched off as well. Mm -hmm. Was that a uh, necessity for practical reasons, or was that because it was already good enough without um, without ABR? Just okay. have a blurry background <clears throat> and yes. good tile. So f first question was, the what is the, a the decoder the requirement? One, only one decoder. Yes. How does that work with that? all the tiles and the Yeah, so, so basically what we see today on the Gear VR, especially the 7 and the S8, you have enough CPU cycle to switch between a 4K, let's say a, a 4K decoder and an HD decoder. So that's what, so we are doing time switching and we have enough cycles, but we are stuck at P30. So that's the first question. Second question. Really testing me now. The, the second question was about well, the third one was about ABR and I'll yeah, try ABR. To remember. Yeah, so ABR is a good discussion. So ah. basically, we think on on the 4K tiling when I transmit four megabit per second on the home experience, I can get four megabits without problem. But it's true if you want to have the best experience on any network, you will have to come to ABR. Now. If you look at the number of units you need to do 8K, which we think is the, the future, you are at 192 SD encoder. If I want to multiply by ABR, I'm probably going to increase this by factor three or four. So you think about 800 SD equivalent encoder, at some time you have a serious business case problem, even if you go to the cloud. So it's getting too complex, so we probably have to find maybe two profile or three profile, but not as many as we have today in a classical uh, dash deployment. I've just remembered my second question was about the minimum uh, characteristics for decoding devices. So what, does it have to have an HEVC? Yeah, decoding so what, what we are doing today, yeah, correct. So what we are doing today, we always use a hardware assist HEVC decoder, so gear VR and tablets have that. Uh, we don't do software-based decoder because we think it's uh, going to suck all the battery. And it's true that, who told me that? I think Chris Jones uh, always jokes at me, say, oh, last year your demo was uh, burning the phone after 10 minutes. This year you can do one hour. So it's true that from S6 to S7 to S8, we see much more CPU available. And the good news is the display doesn't increase. So we still have a fixed display rendering capability, but of course when the display is going to increase, we might be limited. But so far, I think the S8 is a good platform, and I'm looking forward to the $100 Oculus uh, based on the Snapdragon 831 or 21, which will be another beast. But this will be interesting also. When the price goes down, the performance goes down also. I used the opportunity to ask another question about uh, licensing. We have to charge patent, him, huh? Patent trolls potentially uh, waiting for it to be adopted. Not on HEVC, on Dash and 
OMAP yes. or yes. whatever else. OMAP is too early to say because it's uh, still a standard information. MPEG Dash, you know, uh, there was a call for patent from MPEG LA. I think the, the hardest one to deal with is HEVC, and you might, you have seen Apple supporting HEVC, which is good, but you might see some um, patent groups uh, challenging the status quo of existing patent pool who are telling you, I have the essential patents, give me X. You might have people challenging all those patents. So this is uh, news, I would say, uh, still in development. But I would not give up on HEVC because we have so many devices. But it's going to be a, a counterbalance uh, between people who want to do business and people who want to disable this business. So no offense to technical. Okay, Bill, I'm in time. I have uh, 52 seconds remaining.